This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Have you ever wanted to start a website? It's a more useful and popular resource than you might think at first. I mean, if you have practically any online presence across any platform that's more than just an account you use for browsing the web, chances are you could benefit from having a website of your very own. And even if you're just curious, Squarespace makes testing these waters easier than anyone else. You can visit Squarespace to design and create your own website from scratch or by working off of any of their fantastic templates, which is what I did actually, and my website is beautiful. For gaming creators, you can even use your own website to host your videos and re-monetize content for your most dedicated fans by opening up member-only areas. If you'd like to, of course. And what's even better is that you can go to squarespace.com to trial your website completely for free. And once you've spent enough time tweaking it and you're happy with it, head over to squarespace.com bandit to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. It really is that easy. And now, on to the video. Well howdy Legend of Zelda lore partners, fancy seeing you here in a Legend of Zelda lore video. My name is Bandit, and whether you've watched the lore breakdowns on the channel before and need a refresher, you're new to the channel, or you just need a one-stop shop to refer to in the future or share with friends, I've compiled each of the three previous videos I created explaining the lore behind every Link, Zelda, and appearance of Ganon in the series into one easy to access video. So without further ado, sit back, you're welcome, and uh, oh yeah, spoiler alert, obviously. A Zelda game without Link is, uh, not a Zelda game, actually. Which is kind of weird, since he's not even the character that the series is named after. Top 10 anime betrayals number one. But seriously though, Zelda is not Zelda without Link. And if I were to ask you how many Links there are in the franchise, I'm curious, what would your guess be? The answer is, there's actually only one Link in the entire franchise. He just goes through time and is known as the hero of time and solves the world's problems in every iteration. Nah, I'm just kidding, there's like 12 of them. Well, 12 playable ones anyway. And they all have their own origins and stories, and I know what you're thinking. Yeah, Bandit, there may be 12 Links, but I mean, come on, how difficult can Link's lore be? They're all just simple kids that become heroes, right? Well, yes, but also no. They each do have their similarities, but they also all come from different places and end up in different places, and even span multiple games sometimes. So it's worth it to know who's who, and I thought I'd make a shorter video covering exactly that for each and every playable Link in the series, and if you're a fan of any of the games, I'm sure this will be of interest to you. Oh, and spoiler alert for the entire series, obviously. Playable Link number one, the hero of the skies, around the age of 17 when the game takes place. This kid has no parents, at least none that we know of. Seriously, it's weird how many of these games have just no mention at all of Link's mother or father. This Link is just some Skyloftian kid who grew up in Skyloft and aspires to become a Skyloft Knight, which are combat and survival trained knights who ride atop loft wings and ensure the safety of everyone living in Skyloft and the surrounding floating islands. Although I'm not sure why necessarily Skyloft needs knights. I mean, it's not like there are many monsters up here terrorizing the place. Aside from those evil cat monster things that I loathe, but anyway, he had a normal life, you know, for someone living up in the clouds. He even had a school bully, which is unfortunately kind of normal. Normal, which is depressing to say. It's also heavily implied via Demise's dialogue at the end of the game that the Hero of the Skies is the reincarnation of the spirit of the first hero, who was also just some dude that was the chosen champion of the goddess Hylia in the early days when Hylia waged battle against Demise, an act which would forever tie the bloodline of the goddess to the spirit of her chosen hero. Skylink is perhaps the most important Link in the franchise aside from the Hero of Time due to the fact that he is responsible for forging the goddess blade into the Master Sword and defeating Demise. The original Big Bad Wolf. And he and Zelda may have repopulated the surface of the Earth, but anyway, moving on. Playable Link number two, the Hero of the Minish, which is actually just a fan-made title that he doesn't actually receive in-game, but this guy, again, is just some kid around the age of 12 who's a blacksmith in this game, or at least the grandson of a blacksmith known as Smith the Blacksmith. He's childhood friends with the Princess Zelda and just ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time, really, when he accompanies her to the Picori Festival, which is interrupted by Vati finding and destroying the Picori Blade as well as turning Princess Zelda into stone. Her father the king then tasks the hero of the Minish with reforging the Picori Blade and breaking the curse on Zelda, and the rest is history. Minish history. Playable Link number three, the hero of... 
Four, which is a fan-made name from me. I know, naming Link is one of my many gifts, but anyway, this Link is one of the Links with the least amount of backstory in that he's literally just there. For some reason, he just accompanies Zelda one day to check out the Picori Blade, which now goes by the name The Four Sword due to the events in the Minish Cap. Since this is many years after the Minish Cap, but does deal with the same villain and the same blade, it can be assumed that this Link also has a similar backstory to the one in the Minish Cap. Perhaps he's also the grandson of a blacksmith and the childhood friend of a Zelda. Playable Link number four, the one, the only, the hero of time. Be honest, you've heard that catchy title before regardless of if you've played the game, and for good reason too. Because aside from the first hero of the sky, the hero of time is perhaps the most important Link in the entire franchise because of his adventure directly leading to the infamous timeline split, as well as Ganondorf's many different returns. Because of his importance to the story as a whole, his adventures are referenced even in Breath of the Wild, and any references to the ancient hero or legendary hero in the game's following Ocarina of Time are likely references to the hero of time. We also know a bit about his backstory from in-game quotes as well. According to the Deku Tree Sprout, Link is a Hylian who was given to the Great Deku Tree to be raised in the Kokiri Forest as a Kokiri for safekeeping by his mother, who narrowly escaped the Hyrulean Civil War with just enough time to save her baby boy before succumbing to her fatal wounds. Since Link's father is never mentioned in Ocarina of Time but in other games is referred to as a Knight of Hyrule, it can be assumed that the Hero of Time's father likely fought and died in said Civil War as a Knight of Hyrule. The Hero of Time is also the same Link that continues onward into the events of Majora's Mask after he's done ridding the world of Ganondorf before he has a chance to mess things up. He apparently then leads a quiet life in servitude to the Hylian royal family following the events of Majora's Mask and shows up later on in the timeline as a fully grown adult ghost who is a side character to the next playable Link. Enter the Hero of Twilight, Link number 5. This Link is the only Link in the entire series who is directly confirmed to be a blood descendant of the Hero of Time. As proven by the fact that he inexplicably already has the Triforce of Courage in his blood and the Hero of Time, or rather the Hero Shades, dialogue to Link. The Hero of Twilight is also a teenager around the age of 16 to 17 that has no in-game mention of his parents, just like the Hero of the Sky and many other Links. He grew up in the little village of Ordon as a farmhand and for whatever reason is fascinated with swordplay and is actually very proficient at it despite having very little actual experience in that particular field, you know, prior to the events of the game. Speculation tells me that this could mean that his father may have also also been a sword fighter, like he's implied to be in other games, and that he died when Link was very young, leaving the little hero with an inner desire to be like his father. No idea about his mom, though. Another piece of speculation is that the Hero of Twilight's farmhand nature and knowledge of Epona's song is proof of the Hero of Time's marriage to Malon, who is a farm girl who created Epona's song, but that's neither here nor there. Playable Link number six, the Hero of Light from Four Swords Adventures. In this final game that deals with Vati, the evil wind mage, and the Four Sword, and just like the extreme extremely similarly named game Four Swords, the Hero of Light does not really have a backstory but rather just kind of pops up when needed at the start of the game. Again, inexplicably connected to Princess Zelda and the Six Maidens. I choose to believe that these three Four Sword wielding links all have the same backstories because parallel lore is good lore in my opinion, and once again that would mean that Link was Zelda's childhood friend and is the grandson of a smithy named Smith, but that's just my guess. Changing timelines, playable Link number seven would be the Hero of Winds, who is the first Link in the adult timeline. Now this is where Link's backstory starts to get pretty interesting, but let's start with what we know for a fact about this Link. According to Aonuma directly, he's meant to be around 12 years old, which is backed up by the Super Smash Bros. Brawl Toon Link trophy. Link lives in the adult timeline following a great flood on an island known as Outset Island with his grandmother and little sister named Errol. Again though, we're not sure what happened to Link's parents, but since Errol is pretty young, like maybe around 8 or 9 years of age, and the two of them live with their grandmother, we can assume that something bad had probably happened to Link's parents not too terribly long ago and that they are permanently out of the picture because of this. Hence why the kids were then given to their grandmother for safekeeping instead. But now for the fun part, his theoretical non-connection to the spirit of the hero. This is a pretty well-known theory, but keep in mind that it's still just a theory and you're free to believe it or not depending on what you feel like. But anyway, it's theorized that unlike the vast majority of the other Links in the Zelda series, the Hero of Winds is actually not connected to the spirit of the hero. This is because Princess Zelda in Ocarina of Time sent the Hero of Time back in time, spawning the child and adult timelines and removing the hero from the adult timeline altogether. This is also why the Triforce of Courage in the Wind Waker is scattered at the bottom of the ocean because it shattered when the hero was removed from the timeline, unlike living on within the hero's bloodline as proven by the Hero of Twilight in the child timeline. Was that confusing? Okay, let me summarize real quick. What this means essentially is that the Hero of Winds really was just some kid, completely disconnected from any heroic spirits or bloodlines 
friends that came before. He just really wanted to save his little sister and figured, ah hell, why not save the rest of the world while I'm at it? Also, after his adventure with Tetra Zelda ends at the end of the game and Ganondorf and the last King of Hyrule are sealed away once and for all beneath the waves, the two actually go on another adventure, which spawns the events of the Phantom Hourglass and takes place in another ocean realm known as the World of the Ocean King. It's actually pretty similar to the Hyrule vs. Terminus setup, but anyway, that's the Hero of Winds in a nutshell, moving on. The next playable link, so link number 8, is the Hero of Trains from the game Spirit Tracks that takes place apparently 100 years or so after the events of the Hero of Winds in a new land called New Hyrule, which was founded by the Hero of Winds and Tetra Zelda. It's unknown if this link is the descendant of the Hero of Winds, actually it's kind of improbable for a reason I'll get into in just a bit, but either way he also does not have any parents with him when we meet him in game. Go figure, he's just a kid from a village known as Adoba Village and lives with Nico, the very same Nico that once was a pirate serving under the pirate Captain Tetra, only he's an old man now. Link is also the apprentice of a master train engineer named Alfonso, who trained Link, no pun intended, into becoming a royal engineer himself and the rest is history. The reason why I don't think the Hero of Trains is physically related to the Hero of Winds is because you'd think that Nico would know if this Link was the descendant of the older Link. He even tells Link that he looks like the Hero of Winds, who he refers to as an old friend of his. Anyway, I guess the Hero of Trains is to the Hero of Winds what the Hero of Winds was to the Hero of Time. A disconnected but similarly brave hero that also goes to prove the absence of a spirit of the hero in the adult timeline. Well, that and the complete absence of any mention of the Triforce at all in the game aside from some symbols. With the adult and child timelines out of the way, it's time to move on to the problematic one, the what-if styled alternate reality of the fallen timeline. In this timeline, or should I say in this reality, Ganondorf transformed into Ganon and killed the Hero of Time in Ocarina of Time, leaving the job of sealing him away up to the sages alone. Which worked, except for the fact that they kind of sort of sealed him away within the sacred realm and he corrupted the whole thing, turning it into the dark world, but what is this, in all iterations of canon explained? <laughs> No, it's not. So the next playable Link, Link number 9, is the hero of Hyrule from A Link to the Past, who is another of the more impactful Links in the series due to having the most games under his belt that feature him. In this game, Link lives with his uncle, again with no parents to be seen, but at least we're getting closer. The game starts with Princess Zelda being captured by Agony, which is Ganon's alter ego, telepathically communicating with Link and his uncle, pleading them to come and aid her. They both hear this calling because they're both of the blood of the Knights of Hyrule, which is a clan of warriors said to be descendants of the legendary hero, which either refers to the hero of time or the hero of the sky. Either way, Link's uncle is killed trying to rescue Zelda, so Link takes up the mantle and the rest is history. By the way, if you're interested in learning more about Link's connections to the Knights of Hyrule and even their possible connections to the Dark Nut enemies, check out the series of mine about just that. Anyway, after the hero of Hyrule defeats Ganon, who fights him with the power of the Triforce, he goes on to have a few more adventures. The first of which is Link's Awakening, which used to take place after the Oracle games but now takes place before them because Nintendo just decided to swap around the timeline like that. Probably to prove he doesn't die at sea after the game ends, but anyway, that adventure takes place while Link is sailing away from Hyrule in search of adventure elsewhere within a dream of a windfish. But eventually he does go on some real adventures in the lands of Holodrum and Labrina in the Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages games respectively. He also meets two girls known as Din and Nehru in those lands, which is definitely some potential theory material. The next playable Link and the third to last is the new hero of Hyrule, Link number 10. This Link is once again not proven to be connected to the previous Link, the first hero of Hyrule, though I guess either one could be assumed. Since the spirit of the hero was never split off from this reality, but rather was just killed as the hero of time previously, it can be assumed that every hero in the child and fallen timelines are all incarnations of said spirit, so whether or not they're related by blood isn't really important. The new hero of Hyrule solves both Laurel and Hyrule's problems regarding their Triforces and then goes on to have another fashion emergency adventure in Triforce Heroes, which, despite the name, has actually nothing to do with the Triforce. There are also two other links that accompany the new hero of Hyrule in this adventure, but literally, according to Nintendo, it cannot be known who they are or where they come from. Perhaps they're links from other realities. I mean, the entire Fallen timeline is a different reality that happens if the hero of time is killed, so what if we... Y you know what? I'm gonna stop there, actually. The second to last playable link, and the last one with a confirmed location on the timeline, is the original hero from the original Legend of Zelda, and I mean original hero as in the first one we saw 
in real life. On the timeline, however, he's actually quite futuristic. This Link is literally a 10 or 12 year old swords boy who Impa, Zelda's assistant, is saved by when she was attacked by Ganon's henchmen. It just so happens that she had been tasked with finding a capable man of bravery to lead the fight against Ganon's forces and save the kingdom, and with Link showing such skill at such a young age and nobody else really being around, she thought, ah, oh, what the hell, and asked him to save the land, the Triforce, and the princess all together. All of which he does, of course. Once again, though, we're back to having no mention of his parents at all, which should surprise no one at this point. This Link also goes on to another adventure when he's around 16 years of age in the game known as The Adventure of Link, where he finds and awakens an ancient Princess Zelda who had been put into a magical slumber by her brother long ago. Fun fact, when she awakens at the end, this means that there are literally two Princess Zeldas alive in the world at the end of the Fallen Timeline at the same time. Fun stuff. The final playable Link, and the one most fresh on everyone's memory, and the one with the biggest and most blue eyes of them all would be the one, the only, the Hero of the Wilds. Known for his adventures and sick climbing skills in Breath of the Wild. Wild Link's father is actually directly referenced for the first time ever in a Zelda game by Princess Zelda herself. And we even have concept art for him that unfortunately never made it into the game. Zelda claims that Link's dad was a Knight of Hyrule, which makes sense given other Link's affiliations with the group. It even explains why Link himself is in in service of Zelda and the royal family directly as he simply wanted to follow in his father's footsteps. His age is never outright confirmed, but we can assume that he is the same age as Zelda, which is normally the case in the other games, which would mean that he has just turned 17 by the time the game starts. Or should I say 117? As most fans undoubtedly know, the Hero of the Wilds takes on the essence of Demise's hateful malice itself known as the Calamity Ganon, and together with the princess, seals it away once again. But who knows? Maybe that entire fight was just small potatoes compared compared to what's to come in Tears of the Kingdom. I guess we'll just have to find out next May. But for now, that is the end of my list explaining briefly the lore behind every playable Link in the entire series, with a few mentions to the Links not playable in the series. Did you know everything mentioned? Hey guys, it's me, Bandit. I know it's been a little while since my last upload, but things have happened. I randomly woke up in New York City, for instance, but of course you would have known that if you followed me on Instagram. But anyway, I'm back and wanted to start the year off fresh with covering Zelda, as in the princess from the series The Legend of Zelda. You may think you know all there is to know about the well-known princess who gives Toadstool a run for her money in the How Many Times Can You Be Kidnapped competition, but think again. For instance, did you know that unlike the spirit of the hero, Zelda is more of a descendant than a reincarnation, and every daughter born into the original Zelda's bloodline after a certain point in the timeline was to be named Zelda, meaning technically there have been an infinite, unknowable number of Zeldas that we've never even met? Or how about the fact that at one point there were two completely different Princess Zeldas alive and in existence at the same time in the same timeline? Oh yeah, Zelda lore goes hard, and that, my friends, is the name of the game for this video. So without further ado, let us delve into explaining each iteration of Zelda that we know of in the games. Oh, and spoiler alert for the entire franchise, obviously. Since it's easier to explain in-universe lore when following the in-universe lore timeline, we're going to cover the Zelda appearances in the order they take place on the timeline, starting with the very first Zelda from Skyward Sword. This Zelda is different from every other Zelda in that she's not actually royalty. Well, not yet at least. Since the royal family exists immediately following this game and is composed of her descendants, it can be assumed that Skyward Zelda started the royal family when she and Link probably, you know, populated the surface of the earth, but anyway, it was due to the events and adventures surrounding Skyward Zelda's life that we were able to discover her true identity. And that is that she is the reincarnation of the goddess Hylia, who is probably the goddess of time, but that's a whole other theory, and therefore her bloodline is not only royal, but is literally supernatural. And yes, her supernatural blood gives her and her descendants superpowers. She's the full package, but besides her return to the surface and the founding of Hyrule, there's not much else to say about good old Skyward Zelda, so moving on. The next Zelda that pops up on the timeline is the princess from the Minish Cap. We'll call her Minish Zelda. Now, Minish Zelda serves to kind of throw a wrench in the whole Zelda's having powers due to Hylia Bloodline thing because Minish Zelda has a presumably different power flowing through her veins, according to Vati, the main enemy of the game. See, long ago, the teeny tiny little Minish people descended down to the land of regular sized people and gave the ancient Hylians a magical power called the Light Force. This Light Force, which originated 
not from Hylia but from tiny sky people, was similarly placed within the bloodline of Hyrule's princess, and is said to be a source of limitless magical power. So just to be clear, at this point in the timeline, Princess Zeldas have both goddess powers and the unlimited source of magical power called the Light Force in their bloodlines. I suppose a theory could be made that they're one and the same, but well, maybe I'll talk more about that in another video. Hint, hint, wink, wink, subscribe. Back to Minish Zelda though, besides the whole Light Force in her blood thing, the only other chewy piece of lore that she gives to the series would be the fact that she is the first Princess Zelda. And that's about it. The next Princess Zelda is the Zelda from Four Swords. Similarly to the previous two, she also was a childhood friend of her Link and helps Link defeat Vati once again who tried to marry her. Yep, the next Princess Zelda is one of the most important, if not the de facto most important Zelda to the lore of the franchise, and I'm not just saying that because Ocarina of Time is my favorite game of all time. Okay, maybe I am a little bit, but seriously, she has a very fleshed out story and is also literally the reason why the timeline splits in the first place. Well, she's the reason why it splits between adult and child, that is. The Fallen timeline exists either way, but we don't explain that when using actual logic. Anyway, Ocarina Zelda, who is also the same Zelda that kind of makes an appearance in Majora's Mask, is the first Zelda who, alongside the Hero of Time, we get to see both as a child and as an adult. And in both instances, she kind of, sort of, messes everything up, despite trying her hardest to do the right thing. Hashtag relatable. I go into this in much more detail in an old video of mine I did explaining Ocarina Zelda's big mistake, but in a nutshell, as a child, she was given prophetic dreams which detailed evil coming to the world, and a boy in green being the key to saving everyone. In an attempt to do something with her visions, she tried to bring it up to her father, who apparently didn't listen to her. Some Thing that kings of Hyrule have in common with one another, apparently. Since her father lent her no ear, she took matters into her own hands when Link, the weird green forest boy from her dreams, randomly came to see her. She tells Link to get the Master Sword, which he does, which ends up putting Link to sleep for seven years and leaving the door to the Sacred Realm and therefore the Triforce wide freaking open, allowing Ganondorf to just waltz right in and touch it with his greasy Gerudo fingers. Zelda and Impa go into hiding for seven years, and in that time, Zelda trains hard to become an epic gender-swapped Sheikah ninja named Sheik in order to thwart Ganondorf's best efforts to find her. Anyway, once Link has awoken from his slumber seven years later and is guided by Zelda, I mean Sheik, towards the ultimate goal of awakening all the sages, Sheik reveals himself as the Princess Zelda herself and immediately gets captured by Ganondorf after which Link rescues her and normally this is where a happily ever after would come into play, but not for Ocarina Zelda. See, she was so racked with guilt over the whole Link losing his childhood and the world being plunged into seven long years of horribleness things since really it was kind of her fault that it all happened. So to rectify what she could for Link, she decides to send him back to his original timeline, removing the Hero of Time from the adult timeline and permanently splitting the timeline into adult and child. And this is where a multitude of theories take place, such as the rather controversial theory that the spirit of the hero itself was removed from the adult timeline because of this, leading to no hero rising when the world needed him again when Ganon broke out of his seal prior to the events of the Wind Waker. Or my theory that the Master sword was removed from the adult timeline because of this, leading to another blade taking its place also in the Wind Waker. Anyway, we've spent a lot of time discussing Ocarina of Zelda, but the last thing I'll mention is that she has two existences by the end of the game. The grown-up Ocarina of Zelda we see at the end that lives on in the adult timeline and probably helps restore Hyrule, and the kid Ocarina of Zelda we see at the end that lives on in the child timeline and gives Link the Ocarina of Time once again before he goes on his next adventure in Termina. Moving on, we'll cover the adult timeline Zeldas first since I mentioned Wind Waker so much. Princess Zelda in The Wind Waker actually has no idea she's a princess until you're a good ways into the game. And before that, she's a young, 12-year-old pirate queen who went by the name Tetra and inherited a ship and its crew once her mother, the previous pirate queen, passed away. Tetra, as far as we can tell, was born at sea, but is obviously a descendant of Ocarina Zelda, and because of this, we can actually see a giant picture of an ancestor of her lineage down in the submerged Hyrule Castle. A previous Zelda who also had a crew, I guess, positioned around her, which mimics the current pirate crew exactly, implying that Tetra and her crew are all descendants of these ancestors. Along with her bloodline, she also carried with her a fragment of the Triforce of Wisdom, which had been passed down from mother to daughter following the fall of Hyrule and the flooding of the world. As per the events of the game, eventually Tetra, now wearing a dress and going by the name Zelda, helps Link defeat Ganondorf and the world of Hyrule is drowned once and for all. And then Zelda takes off her dress and goes back to going by the name Tetra and sails off with Link for more adventures at sea. She does make 
make a slight appearance in the game's direct sequel, The Phantom Hourglass, where she is pretty much immediately captured until the end of the game, at which point she returns to the pirate's life. However, the next Zelda in the adult timeline is a descendant of Tetra Zelda, who discovered a new land with Link and founded New Hyrule and the New Royal Family before passing away. Spirit Track Zelda is specifically Tetra's great-great-granddaughter, and shares a backstory with the Four Swords Zelda in that she's been a childhood friend of Link and pulls an Ocarina Zelda by secretly meeting with Link and plotting to investigate matters without involving any adults. In this case, they begin investigating the disappearance of the Spirit Tracks. Also, she is actually the first playable Zelda in the franchise, which is a huge milestone for the series. Hmm? What's that? You say you remember another playable Zelda before Spirit Tracks Zelda? <laughs> No, you don't. That was just a bad dream. Anyway, Spirit Track Zelda also serves as the game's companion character after she's, uh, killed, actually. Well, not killed per se, but her soul leaves her body, so you tell me what that means. Anyway, bada bing, bada boom, she and Link kick all sorts of booty, and eventually Link exorcises Princess Zelda's possessed body and she's able to regain it. After which they kick the new Demon King Maladus' booty and restore order to the land of New Hyrule together. And now the adult timeline has a happily ever after ending. Moving over to the child timeline, the first Zelda to appear in a game after Ocarina Zelda does in Majora's Mask would be Twilight Zelda from the game Twilight Princess. Now, in the child timeline, Ganondorf's takeover of Hyrule was prevented due to Link going back in time and, well, preventing it. However, the Triforce was still split into three pieces somehow, which means that it may exist outside of the timelines, but that is not a subject I'm willing to get into right now. I said that because in Twilight Princess, the descendants of the Hero of Time and Ocarina Zelda both already have their pieces of the Triforce in their bloodlines, which is really neither here nor there, but I just wanted to cover it real quick. Anyway, Twilight Zelda, by the time the game takes place, is the sole ruler of Hyrule, which is proven by the fact that when Zant barges into the throne room to take it over, it's Zelda herself that he approaches and not a king or anybody else. Which should mean that technically she should be Queen Zelda? So I'm just gonna call her Queen Zelda from now on. Anyway, Zant forces Queen Zelda to surrender and thus plunges the world of Hyrule into Twilight, with Zelda being held prisoner in her own castle, which I guess could be worse, all things considered. I mean, at least she has a view of the kingdom that she surrendered, whose inhabitants are now eternally suffering. Anyway, eventually Link and the real Twilight Princess named Midna approach Zelda while Midna is dying after Zant forcefully plunges her into the light. As a being of Twilight, her life begins to fade very quickly, but just before she takes her last breath, Queen Zelda decides to sacrifice her essence in order to save Midna's life, transforming Midna from being just a being of Twilight into a being of both light and Twilight. Now, I'd like to interject a little mini theory of mine regarding how Zelda was able to do this and dissipate entirely, but yet also have her soulless body show up later in order to be possessed by Ganondorf. I mean, if this was Zelda's body that just disappeared into thin air, what, did Ganondorf just conjure up a new body in Zelda's image just because he wanted to possess a Zelda? I think not personally. I think the answer is tied to why she's strangely able to resist turning into a spirit like all the other Hyruleans do when exposed to Twilight. Simply put, I think she actually is a spirit here. Similar to the other spirits, but not quite. See, I think that perhaps she was granted some special protections from her piece of the Triforce when subjected to the influence of Twilight, just like Link when he was turned into a wolf instead of a spirit. And if you think about it, we already know that the Triforce pieces protect their bearers from Twilight protect their bearers from Twilight, but act differently when exposed to Twilight. The Triforce of Courage turns its bearer into a courageous beast, while the Triforce of Power turns its bearer into literally a flaming ball of power. So what if the Triforce of Wisdom allows its bearer to manifest their spirit or their mind's essence from within their body in order to still be interact with other beings of light or Twilight? What I'm saying is what if Queen Zelda's body never left the throne room and we're actually speaking to her Triforce-enabled spirit in the castle tower? Or, or maybe it's a holographic double of her body, which is something that the Sheikah have been known to do, which is why she's wearing a Sheikah cloak, but, you know, regardless, after defeating her Ganondorf-possessed body, Zelda's essence leaves Midna and returns to her own body, after which she aids Link in 25% of the battle against Ganondorf by shooting him with light arrows on horseback. Once he's finally dead and gone after the climactic four-part battle, Zelda is seen saying goodbye to Midna at the Mirror of Twilight, <laughs> forever, and afterwards presumably returns to her right place at the throne of Hyrule. Later on in the timeline, Four Swords Adventures takes place, which features the next Zelda. Once again, it can be assumed that she was childhood friends with Link like the Zelda from Four Swords, but like the Zelda from A Link to the Past, which we haven't gotten to just yet, she is able to telepathically communicate with Link and asks him to join her at the Four Swords Sanctuary in order to check up on what's going on with all the ominous clouds of darkness covering the land. Turns out it was a trap by Shadow Link and Vati once again is released upon Link drawing the Four Sword. Vati once again kidnaps a Zelda for the third 
third time now, and Zelda, after being rescued by Link, aids Link in defeating Ganon. The end. Moving over to the Fallen timeline, or as we should call it, the alternate reality in which Link dies at the end of Ocarina of Time, the first Zelda that appears after Ocarina Zelda would be the Princess Zelda of A Link to the Past. This Zelda starts off the game by telepathically communicating with the members of the Knights of Hyrule, which in this case means Link and his uncle. She asks for help because she's been kidnapped by the wizard Aghanim, who was trying to sacrifice all of the descendants of the Seven Wise Men to undo their seal on Ganon in the Dark World, which he was imprisoned within after he offed Link. Anyway, Link is not able to salve Zelda and she gets sacrificed, straight up, which in this universe means that she gets sent to the Dark World, trapped on top of Death Mountain. She doesn't do too much after this point because, well, she can't, and eventually Link frees her and wishes upon the Triforce for evil to be dispelled from the land, after which Zelda is able to return to Hyrule. This Zelda is the same Zelda that is referenced in the Oracle games and even kidnapped once again, go figure, if the games are linked. Twin Rova, who apparently was not killed in the Fallen timeline, is the one who kidnaps Zelda at this point and attempts to sacrifice her in order to resurrect their son, Ganondorf. Link prevents this, but they end up just sacrificing themselves in order to resurrect a mindless version of Ganondorf, Ganon, who is beaten by Link, and once again Zelda is able to return to Hyrule unscathed, but probably traumatized. The next Zelda that pops up is the Zelda from A Link Between Worlds, who, like Twilight Zelda, rules over her land alone, without a father or a mother or a suitor. When she first meets Link, she is warned about Yuga running around, turning people into paintings and being generally obnoxious, at which point she tells Link to go warn Sahasrala and gives him the Pendant of Courage, which is one of the three pendants of virtue necessary for drawing the Master Sword from deep within the Lost Woods in this game and in A Link to the Past. She did this because she had a feeling that they just might need a hero, and boy was she right, because not too long afterwards, Yuga comes for Zelda herself and ends up kidnapping her by turning her into a beautiful painting and yanks her into Laurel with Link following behind. And similarly to Aghanim from A Link to the Past, Yuga uses Zelda and the rest of the sages to revive Ganon, and then merge with Ganon, forming Yuga Ganon, who eventually will be defeated by Link. Zelda and Hyrule are saved at this point, but before I move on to the next Zelda in the timeline, I'm going to cover the other Zelda in this very game. And by that, I mean Laurel's version of Zelda, the Princess Hilda, who has a lot to do with the story because she's actually the one behind Yuga's actions. Honestly, I'm still very impressed with this game for pulling one over on us like that. Yuga was actually Hilda's court mage, but I'll get to that in a second. See, she's nice for the majority of the game and quote unquote stops Yuga Ganon from killing Link after Link arrives in Laurel and even serves to telepathically guide Link as he journeys across both lands. And it isn't until the end of the game that we finally get upside down Zelda's backstory. Hilda's version of Hyrule, called Laurel, used to have its own Triforce, which similarly to Hyrule's Triforce was also brutally fought over by the Lorulean inhabitants. Differing from Hyrule, however, Hilda's ancestors decided to use the Triforce to destroy the Triforce, which is the kind of big brain move that would make Thanos proud, but mistake! Laurel can't actually survive without a Triforce, it was never designed to. So Hilda instead searched for another Triforce, and she found one. Our Triforce. Hyrule's Triforce. So at the end of the game, she reveals that our Triforce is what she and Yuga were after all along. And she then steals Zelda's Triforce of Wisdom and summons Yuga Ganon once again, who has Ganon's Triforce of Power, somehow, and commands Yuga Ganon to straight up kill Link in order to gain the Triforce of Courage. Which is unsuccessful because she forgot Link's kind of a badass. Hilda then asks Yuga Ganon to give her his piece, but Yuga Ganon says, okay, I hear you, but what if you gave me yours? And then he takes her piece in an act of brutal betrayal and then turns Hilda into a painting herself and absorbs her. After Link defeats him yet again, both Triforce pieces and Hilda are released from Yuga Ganon's gut. Hilda then actually starts to try to attack Link, but is stopped by Upside Down Link, also known as Ravio, the cowardly rabbit dude. After talking with Ravio, she finally sees the error in her ways and sends Link and Zelda back to Hyrule, who in return, wish upon Hyrule's Triforce to restore Laurel's Triforce, which is the Zelda universe equivalent of wishing for more wishes. But the point is, it works, and both this Zelda and this Hilda live happily ever after, as far as we can tell. The third to last Zelda in the series pops up in the next game in the Fallen timeline, the original Legend of Zelda. She's got a bit of a simple story in that she breaks her Triforce of Wisdom into eight pieces and scatters them across the land in order to hide them from Ganon, who has been resurrected by his father followers prior to the events of the game. Yeah, that keeps happening. Someone should do something about that. She sends her handmaiden Impa out to look for a hero. Impa finds a 10-year-old with a sword and goes, hey, you know what, that could work, and thus enlists the child known as Link in the service of saving the world. Ganon reaches Zelda in the meantime and imprisons her underneath Death Mountain, where she waits until the end of the game when Link saves her, and in her gratitude she says, 
Thanks, Link. You're the hero of Hyrule. Moving on, the next game and last game in the Child Timeline is The Adventure of Link, which takes place six years after the previous game and technically features the same Princess Zelda, although she never actually makes an appearance due to, you know, ruling Hyrule and all that. However, the entire point of Link's journey in this game is to find and awaken an ancient sleeping Princess Zelda, who is the next Zelda that I'll be talking about now. Sleeping Beauty Zelda was the princess of Hyrule long ago, when it was ruled by her father and, following her father's death, her brother the prince. It is said that her father used the Triforce for good and made Hyrule all nice and peachy. But after he died, he decided for whatever reason to not tell his son where to find the entire Triforce, but told his daughter Zelda instead. I guess she was the favorite child. At this point, some random wizard, perhaps even another residual alter ego of Ganon appears and tells the prince that his sister knows where the other pieces are. At which point, both the prince and the wizard angrily question Zelda, but the stubborn sleeping beauty gives them nothing, likely out of fear that the Triforce's ultimate wishing power would be misused, which is a healthy fear. However, the wizard got upset and places Zelda into an eternal slumber and then dies after casting the spell. This was not at all what the prince wanted to happen because, after all, he loved his sister, and therefore this made him pretty upset. And it's because of this very story that he, being the new king of Hyrule, decreed that all daughters born into the royal lineage would therefore be named Zelda. Anyway, that being said, eventually Link saves her and wakes her up from her ancient sleep and she says, you saved Hyrule and you are a real hero. Then they kiss and you cannot convince me otherwise. The most notable thing about the existence of Sleeping Beauty Zelda, to me, is the fact that at this point in time there are legitimately two Princess Zeldas alive at the same time. This one and the one from the previous game who's currently ruling Hyrule. The question is, following the adventure of Link, doesn't this mean that there are now two royal family lines? I mean, come on, did nobody at Nintendo really think this one through? Did they forget? Somehow I doubt we will ever get an answer to that. The final Princess Zelda in the series would be the one and only Zelda of the Wild from Breath of the Wild. Now, this Zelda is probably the most popular of all the Zeldas on account of her being from the most popular Zelda game of all time. And because of that, I'll just briefly touch on her story since most of you probably know all there is to know about her by now. In a shell of a nut, she was, as every Zelda before her besides Skyward Zelda, born a princess of Hyrule. But unlike her mother and presumably all the other females of the royal line, she was never able to unlock the powers of her bloodline. This caused her to try to find other ways to aid the land of Hyrule and thus she partnered closely with her Sheikah friends and became somewhat of a scientist herself. Herself. She even went so far as to lead the five chosen Hyrulean champions who were each chosen to pilot a divine beast following the prophecy of Ganon's return and the discovery of the ancient Sheikah automations. However, she never stopped trying to unlock her powers. People like her father and the influence of the all-too-successful Link who was the same age as her didn't let her forget. If anything, it just added to her overall stress, poor thing. It wasn't until Calamity Ganon finally reared its ugly head on her 17th birthday of all days, and after everyone she knew had died except for Link that her powers finally unlocked in order to save Link's life at the very last second. It's called love, people. Anyway, after that, she sends Link off to the Shrine of Resurrection where it spends 100 freaking years rebuilding his body and goes off to Hyrule Castle herself to contain Calamity Ganon until Link revives and is able to, you know, be a hero, telepathically communicating with him all the while. Link does indeed kick Calamity Booty and Zelda is able to seal it away using the last of her power. She did have a 100 year run with it though, so I'm sure she's good for now. Following the events of Breath of the Wild, apparently the Sheikah machines stop working, such as Varuta, and presumably Link and Zelda set off to investigate, and we have now officially fully explained every Zelda and even alternate universe Zelda there is in the franchise. All the way until Zelda of the Wild's upcoming appearance in Tears of the Kingdom, of course. But the only thing we know about her in-game so far is that she's rocking a new haircut, and also she might be dead. I'm looking forward to finding out in just over 100 days, though. If you're looking forward to finding out, and if you're... A Zelda game without Ganon is actually kind of typical, which is pretty weird to think about. Because even though technically speaking, Ganon is the original Zelda villain from a real life perspective, he's not the original villain when it comes to in-game lore. And he's only present in like half of the games. But that aside, clearly Ganon is the most recognizable Zelda villain of them all and one of the most well-known in gaming as a whole. Not only due to the fact that he did originate from the first game in the 80s, but also because he's just plain cool. And ironically, is one of the famous chosen in 3 who received the power of the Triforce at several different points in the series. This depth makes him stand out as a unique villain and in this video I'm going to explain the lore behind every appearance of Ganon throughout the series. Oh, and spoiler alert, 
obviously. The first things that I'm going to tackle are a couple of burning questions that some of you no doubt have. The first of which would be, what is the difference, if any, between Ganon and Ganondorf? What a great question, I'm so glad you asked. Ganondorf, although not present in the series until the fifth game in the franchise, Ocarina of Time, actually comes before Ganon as far as lore is concerned. What I mean by that is that Ganondorf, the Gerudo human being, was first and then transformed into Ganon via the power of the Triforce of Power. Now this is slightly theoretical and you're more than welcome to disagree with me because of that, as is your prerogative when discussing things not directly confirmed in-game, but my understanding is that Ganon is the demonic beast form that Ganondorf transforms into when augmented by a great power source, such as the Triforce, or the Twilight, or Malice. And this explanation for Ganon's existence is what I'll be branching off of for the entirety of this video. The second burning question that you may have is, what do I mean every Ganon in the series? Isn't there just one? Well, yes, but also no. Most Ganons are actually the same, yes, just split up by different timelines and appear differently depending on multiple different factors. However, one Ganon in particular is actually a straight up reincarnation, and therefore another Ganon entirely. You see, in the child timeline, which we'll get back to at some point later in the video, Ganondorf is killed, straight up. But then another Ganondorf is born at some point in the future and eventually transforms into another Ganon and subsequently gets sealed away at the end of Four Swords Adventures. That being said, each appearance, whether the same Ganon slash dwarf or not, will be covered in full detail, so just hang tight. The last question to tackle before getting into the nitty gritty would be the question of whether or not Ganon is the literal reincarnation of Demise's hatred, which, as many people will remember, is the beginning of the seemingly endless cycle of good versus evil that we see happen in every Zelda game. My answer to that is no. Ganon is not the literal incarnation of Demise's hatred, at least not directly. He's more of a byproduct. See, a lot of people, including me formerly, assume that Ganon is the demon that Demise's eternal hatred manifests as. But that explanation doesn't allow for the existence of other demon kings and lords, such as Maladus or Majora, which also embody the hatred of Demise. Instead, I now believe that Demise simply cursed his hatred into a reincarnating existence in the exact same way that Link or the spirit of the hero reincarnates. And similarly to the spirit of the hero, will always reincarnate as an individual that may then become augmented and turn into a demon. This automatically explains every major demon and every major antagonist, such as Vati or Ganondorf or the other Ganondorf, because once one of them dies, another will eventually reincarnate due to the curse, just like another Link will eventually reincarnate due to the blessing, if you will. Yet another similarity and parallelism between Hylia and Demise, but that's enough talking about not Ganon and Ganon's own video, so let's move on. According to prophecy that was set in place an unknown time ago by forces currently unknowable, the desert-dwelling Gerudo people give birth to a male child only only once every hundred years, and once of age, that boy is by default to become the king of the Gerudo. This was the age-old custom of the Gerudo until one particular boy was born and crowned king, and his name was Ganondorf. He was born long ago, before the events of Ocarina of Time, and is introduced to us in-game as the Gerudo king who apparently swore allegiance to the king of Hyrule. However, as Zelda correctly predicted, this allegiance was fake, and Ganondorf's true intent was to find and seize the Triforce for himself, which was under the protection protection of the royal family of Hyrule. And that's the only backstory to Ganondorf that we had all the way until his appearance in The Wind Waker, when we finally were able to realize the deeper reasoning behind his actions, which, put simply, he did out of jealousy. As the ruler of the Gerudo, he knew firsthand of all the hardships that come with living in the desert, and he wanted the land of Hyrule for his own because of this. However, instead of acting nobly and perhaps collaborating somehow with the king of Hyrule to alleviate the harsh living conditions of his people, he instead sought to usurp the throne of Hyrule forcefully and take its omnipotent Triforce for his own. No matter his reasoning though, he eventually did discover the Triforce and upon attempting to touch it, split it apart into the three pieces of power, wisdom, and courage, which rested within Ganondorf, Zelda, and Link respectively. For seven long years, he searched for the other two pieces while sitting atop his stolen throne of Hyrule. And eventually, Link brings both himself and Zelda to Ganondorf's front door. After being defeated by Link in combat, Ganondorf calls upon the power of the Triforce of power within him and transforms into a hideous demon, introducing the world to the monster known as Ganon, the effects and legacy of which we have yet to escape to this day. It's also worth mentioning that ever since Ganondorf's reign over the Gerudo and transformation into the Demon King Ganon, the Gerudo people have officially sworn off all males, assumedly including their own. It's confirmed that there have been no kings since Ganondorf, but it's unknown as to whether or not there have still been other Gerudo men born. But back to Ganon. As a side note, for what it's worth, I think that Phantom Ganons are named Phantom Ganon instead of 
Phantom Ganon Dwarf, even though they directly look like Ganondorf instead of Ganon, because Ganon is also the term we use for magical doppelgangers of Ganondorf, if you will. That's really neither here nor there, but I just wanted to take a moment and explain my thought process since technically Phantom Ganons are, you know, Ganons, at least in name. But back to Ganon Ganon. As you know, following the events of Ocarina of Time, the timeline splits into three separate ones. The adult, which follows the events pictured here, the child, which follows the events pictured here, and the fallen, which follows events we don't see actually, since it's more of an alternate reality where Ganon manages to defeat Link. In each of these timelines, we see Ganon again, but notably in vastly different appearances. In the adult timeline, he appears again as a puppet, something unable to move on its own. In the child timeline, he appears as a four-legged beast and is the only time he appears this way in the entire series aside from Breath of the Wild. And in the fallen timeline, he appears similarly to his original Ocarina of Time appearance as a two-legged humanoid pig man monster thing. Now, I happen to believe that the differing appearances are no coincidence at all, and allow me to explain. In the first place, I don't think the Ganon transformation is reversible, at least the Ganon that Ganondorf transforms into. I think the only times we see Ganondorf transform into Ganon and then back into Ganondorf are specifically occasions where Link is able to kill Ganon, such as at the end of Ocarina of Time or Twilight Princess. In both of these circumstances, Ganondorf still had the Triforce of Power in his possession, which likely prevented him from completely dying after Link does something like this. Now I know some of you will immediately think about the ending scene of Twilight Princess where Ganondorf, still having the Triforce of Power inside him, still ends up dying, but I've already concocted an entire theory about that subject exactly, which I will not explain here for lack of time. So if you're interested, check out my video on that exact subject, which will be linked below. Anyway, if we think about it this way, as in if Ganon is a permanent transformation unless defeated, this would automatically explain each differing appearance. Puppet Ganon from Wind Waker strangely appears as a lifeless puppet, and after being defeated, it's revealed that it truly was not Ganondorf after all, and in fact, the real Ganondorf had been chilling on top of the giant chandelier thing, controlling Puppet Ganon the whole time. So let's imagine for a moment that, since Wind Waker takes place after the events at the end of Ocarina of Time in the adult timeline where Link kills Ganon, that form can no longer be transformed into. Because of this, Ganondorf, who has been making several Phantom Ganons in the game, creates a final Phantom Ganon that transforms into Puppet Ganon, which Ganondorf controls directly instead of actually transforming into it himself. By contrast, in the child timeline, which takes place before Ganondorf was ever able to transform into Ganon in the first place, at the end, the Gerudo King calls upon the power of the Twilight to accomplish several things, such as possessing Princess Zelda, and after being squeezed out of her, transforming into Dark Beast Ganon. Which, by the way, is the only other four-legged Ganon, aside from the Ganon in Breath of the Wild, who's also referred to as the Dark Beast Ganon, almost as if to imply that they are different transformations because they transformed due to different power sources, Twilight and Malice. And the reason he transformed into more of a beast in Twilight Princess is, in my opinion, the same reason that Link transforms into a wolf in the same game. It's due to the exposure to Twilight. Since both Link and Ganondorf have Triforces in their systems, and Link transforms into a wolf if exposed, why not Ganondorf into a wolf pig thing? And after his defeat as Ganon, he de-transforms into a ball of pure energy, does battle with Midna, then appears in Hyrule Field as Ganondorf once again, with Dark Beast Ganon dead and gone at this point, never to be seen again. Later on in the timeline, following Ganondorf's death at the end of Twilight Princess, another Ganondorf is born, and I know Four Swords Adventures lore is kind of messy because of this, but hey, it's canon and it's on the timeline right here, so it's got to have some sort of explanation, which is that Demise's hatred once again reincarnates as another Ganondorf, but this time he transforms into Ganon via unknown means. It can be assumed, though, that he transformed because he obtained the Trident, but like I said, it's unclear since you really don't see Ganon or Ganondorf at all in the game and the Triforce is nowhere to be seen. Anyway, in the alternate reality called the Fallen Timeline, Ganondorf transforms into Ganon but is actually able to kill Link. However, due to Link having already awakened the Sages and according to the intro of A Link to the Past, Ganon was stopped by the Sages aka the Wise Men and sealed away within the Sacred Realm, along with the full Triforce, which implies that he also retrieved the Triforce of Wisdom from Zelda following Link's death. Well, actually that bit right there is a little bit of a headcanon from me. What A Link to the Past actually says happened is Ganondorf just straight up murdered all his minions so that he alone could enter the Sacred Realm and grab the Triforce for himself, successfully wishing upon it to rule the world and corrupting the Sacred Realm into the Dark World. It's a bit contradictory though in several places, since it says that Ganondorf actually was able to wish upon the Triforce, which means that for some reason the Triforce wish worked instead of splitting apart like it did when he tried to wish upon it in Ocarina of Time, and also it implies the door to the Sacred Realm was open and that Ganondorf then transformed into 
to Ganon inside the realm and was sealed within it. If this were true, then Link would have still woken up seven years later since he was asleep at this time and likely would have, you know, done something about the situation. Since it literally is contradictory and actually seems to reference events not linked to Ocarina of Time, I choose to personally explain the Fallen timeline as Link being eliminated at the final battle of Ocarina of Time and then the events that a link to the past happens afterwards. But you can believe whatever you wish as it ultimately doesn't matter much for explaining the existence of Ganon. The point is, his Triforce powered transformation was into a two-legged humanoid pig monster. When he's defeated for the first time at the end of A Link to the Past, the Triforce is not present within him, so he actually does die completely. He's halfway resurrected again in the events of the Oracle games via his surrogate mother's twin Rova, although the resurrection is interrupted by Link and only a mindless Ganon is revived and subsequently killed. Later on in A Link Between Worlds, Yuga specifically harnesses the power of the Seven Maidens who are the descendants of the Wise Men, aka the Sages, to resurrect and transform into Ganon, or in this case, Yuga Ganon, and of course is killed once again by the hero of Hyrule. And once again, later on in the timeline, prior to the events of the original Legend of Zelda game, Ganon is once again revived by his lingering followers and leads an assault against Hyrule in order to obtain the Triforce of Wisdom, which Zelda has broken and scattered across the land preemptively. Ganon is once again killed by Link and technically revived again in the next game Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link if Link dies. That's a big if though, but I mean, hey, maybe it spawns another Fallen Timeline, off of the Fallen Timeline. So, the Fallen Fallen Timeline. Yeah. That makes sense. With Ganon's many different appearances throughout the timelines explained, it's time to talk about his latest appearances as Calamity Ganon and Dark Beast Ganon in Breath of the Wild. Right off the bat, and trust me, I'm not copying out of explaining it, I'm just avoiding full-on speculation by admitting that it's hard to explain the specifics of Ganon's appearance here due to Breath of the Wild not officially connecting to any one of the previous timelines. And of course, theories can be made, but this is not a timeline theory video, so I digress. The one thing that carries over across all the timelines, though, is the hatred of of demise. And what I can say is that by the time of Breath of the Wild, Ganon is more of an idea than an actual being that resurfaces eternally, sometimes spanning 10,000 years in between appearances. And that both Calamity Ganon and Dark Beast Ganon and heck, even the Blight Ganons are all made of the same goopy evil substance referred to as Malice, none of which are actual transformations of Ganondorf like the other Ganons from the timelines, but rather are puppets, if you will, or perhaps phantoms that are all manifesting outside Ganondorf's corpse. He's been able to make Phantom Ganons before, but it always used to be either due to Gerudo Dark Magic or the power of the Triforce of Power. So the real question we should be asking is, what is Malice specifically and where does it come from? I know people will immediately say that Malice as a substance has ties way back to Skyward Sword, in that it's heavily implied that that's what monsters are made out of in that game. But Ganondorf's not a monster, right? He's human or he was at some point. So where did the malice come from? Well, with Tears of the Kingdom right around the corner, I think this very question is about to get an answer and therefore Calamity Ganon will finally be fully explained. We already know that it looks like malice is coming from Ganondorf's corpse, but again, he didn't used to ooze reddish purple jelly out of his chest, so something must have changed. Maybe an old foe is returning from their eternal slumber and needs a physical body to possess. But before we dive headfirst into speculation station, I'm gonna go ahead and pump the brake there. Thank you so much for watching and if you enjoyed the